day 401 to 403. Are you with… with them? Christina's blue, almond-shaped eyes looked up at mine in surprise, and something else. A year and two months ago, the world had ended with nuclear war. Three months before that, though, the world had already ended for me when Christina, my fiancé at the time, had broken off our engagement. Now we were both face to face in the middle of a camp full of raiders and cannibals, her a slave and me on an undercover assignment. What? I… no, I… Uh, wait, how much do I trust her exactly? She wore the slave collar, but for how long? Maybe she'd gotten Stockholm Syndrome or I don't know. I couldn't endanger my mission. What are you doing here? You were supposed to be on the East Coast. Despite our ridiculous circumstance, I couldn't help but feel the same anger from our breakup surface again. My life was here in the West Coast and her job had demanded that she go to the East Coast. It was a career-making move, but I couldn't just up and leave my life. I told her we could do long distance for a bit while I sorted things out, but she had flat out refused. Instead, she broke it all off and then disappeared to the East Coast, I had assumed. I was burning with questions, a lot of them the same ones I had 15 months ago. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I needed some time before starting my new life. I thought it was best to have a buffer, you know, sort my feelings out before starting… She waved her hand dismissively. I got it. It hurt like hell, but I got it. What hurt most was the three months I believed I was out in Los Angeles all alone while she had been right there the entire time. I had a million questions, and I could tell so did she. But we were interrupted by a giant of a man growling in her direction. Hey, you eyeballing my property? The big man hustled over. He was easily twice my size, a significant amount of it fat. At his side was a rubber rod of some sort with wood stapled onto it. My eyes drifted from it to matching bruises visible peeking out from the back of Christina's shirt. Terrible, red hot fury filled me, pooling at my feet and slowly spreading upward, filling me with a sickening warmth, a prelude to ultra violence. Girl, get those narrow hips to work. I didn't purchase you to make conversation. Christina shot her eyes downward, picking up the laundry basket and hurrying off. That's right, move fast, or I'll teach you again to move expediently. The man laughed a deep, gurgling giggle, enjoying his own joke. My hand reached instinctively for the knife I'd kept in a sheath on my back, clipped to my belt. But Watson's hand was there first, grabbing mine and stopping it before it got to the knife handle. I hadn't even heard him approach. Now, why don't you skedaddle on out of here and step away from my property? She ain't for sale, at least not yet. Maybe once I've worn her out, she's useless. He laughed again. My hand jerked toward the knife. Watson gave my wrist a powerful squeeze. Watson didn't let go of my hand until that man was out of sight. My entire body trembled with rage. Once he was confident we were out of earshot of anyone around, Watson finally spoke. It don't matter none who she was to you. You gotta ask yourself. That one girl worth the lives of everyone at Big Bear or Farmbridge. I didn't respond, merely stared in the direction Christina had disappeared to. We got a job to do out here. Our folks are counting on us to keep our cool. Finally, I nodded, slowly. Days 404 to 409. I learned Christina's schedule and routine well enough to be able to meet her for short, private moments. She told me she'd been in the valley when the bombs hit, then made her way out of the city with a group of survivors. They'd done all right for a few months, but then got caught by a group of raiders. That group had killed and butchered two of her group for meat, then dragged the survivors out here to Tahoe. The survivors were sold into slavery. She'd been first sent to one of the camp labor crews, but her new owner, Saul, had spotted her and bought her for a pretty penny, she'd been told. He wanted to make her his wife, but she'd put up too much of a fight. He threatened to kill her if it wouldn't be so unprofitable. Instead, she did all the manual work he needed done. The story was enough to make me want to murder Saul and everyone in this camp. I abhorred the idea of slavery, and this place was practically built on it. I told Christina I was going to get her out of there, but I couldn't, not yet. I didn't elaborate, I still didn't know if I could fully trust her. It hurt seeing her again, but I was glad to even if she was a slave. At least now I knew she'd survived. Our mentor from the Raiders was a middle-aged man named Robert. Like Watson, he looked like he had a rough life back before the war and seemed to fit right into our post-apocalyptic reality. He had a wife and a kid that lived in the compound with him. A tough but fair man, I couldn't help but like him, despite the fact that he was a raider, or at least he worked for them. I don't know what I expected from a society built by raiders, but I was learning more and more every day. They had laws, no stealing, no fighting in public, no killing. It was much the same as you'd expect from any society, really. Difference was they enforced these rules using violence and allowed things like slavery, cannibalism of your own stock, and, well, raiding. 
but the latter was only allowed outside of officially established territory. Communities inside that territory were off limits, as long as they paid their taxes, that is. They didn't join voluntarily most of the time, it was sort of extortion. But taxes guaranteed protection, and that was well worth the investment. It was law and order, but law and order reminiscent of a more savage time. Not the 21st century society we'd all shared just a year and a half ago. But like any society, it had good people and it had its bad people. I was learning that Robert was one of the good people, which made his role in the whole thing even more confusing. Days 410 to 413. They called themselves the Army of the Sun, because in their twisted minds they were bringing the dawn of civilization back to the savage wastelands. To join them, Robert finally gave us one of several assignments we'd have to undertake to prove we were capable and trustworthy. We were going out tax collecting, or rather to find out why one of the farms not too far away had stopped sending shipments of food as agreed upon with the army. Robert came with us as we set off, and I got just enough of warning that I could find Christina and let her know. I told her I'd be back soon and for her to stay safe while I was gone. She grabbed my hand when no one was looking and gave it a quick squeeze. I ached inside with the desire to wrap her up in my arms and hug her. I made up my mind that one way or another when I got back, I'd deal with the Saul situation. Days 414 to 418. Being on the road gives you time to learn about your travel companions. Maybe grow close to them. Watson and I had bonded during our short travels together by our shared desire to keep our loved ones safe, at any cost. In the old world, we might have lived different lives and probably voted for different people, if Watson voted at all. I doubted the mountain man did, but we quickly bonded by the challenges we both faced in this new world. Still, I couldn't quite say Watson was a real friend. He was too aloof for that. A trusted companion or squad mate was more like it. Despite myself though, Robert quickly grew on me. He had a warm personality, and it seemed like once we were away from the pressures of the raider civilization he opened up more. I found myself wondering what in the world a man like that was doing here, and I asked him. He looked at me with genuine sadness in his eyes and told me it was a matter of practicality. He had a family. He'd seen what happened to the world after the bombs fell, how people had changed and turned to their animalistic desires. The army offered safety, protection, and it was even recivilizing the wastes. Before the Iron Lady had showed up, this entire area was just a bunch of groups tearing each other apart. She'd united them, hammered out any differences, and brought stability and order. He wasn't blind to the evils here, but what could one man do? I played it coy and told him I'd heard rumors of the settlements out west, in old California, that were growing and building. He shook his head. The lady had an army here, and her territory was growing. It was only a matter of time before they got swallowed up too. Here, Watson finally joined in the conversation, adding only that some values were worth standing up and dying for, otherwise what made a man a man. After that he became a bit distant, I think Watson's words struck home. I had thought of the raiders in black and white terms, but Robert was giving uncomfortable nuance to the situation. Days 419 to 422. Our travel took us east, past the tip of Lake Havasu and into the desert. Lake Havasu City was north of us and a ghost town that the desert had reclaimed. Most of its inhabitants had been poisoned by the massive plumes of radiation billowing in from the big cities. The army had a portion of the northern city, putting slaves to work on restoring it. There was a small community of ranchers out here, and one family specifically had been short on their taxes, and it was our job to find out why. I raised the concern that the ranchers probably outnumbered us and might just kill us off, but Robert assured me that doing so would be suicide for the entire community as the army would reap its revenge. It was late in the evening with us about a day from our destination that we heard the gunshots in the distance. We immediately set off to investigate as the gunshots grew quicker, more desperate. Someone was in trouble and we broke out in a run. Being the younger, more fit member of our group, I quickly took a very wide lead. Cresting a hill, I spotted the scene of carnage below. Several men and women lay dead. Looks like one side had ambushed the other. From the looks of it, there were only two survivors, a man and an older woman. The man knocked her to her knees and brought the butt of a rifle down on her head, but she moved it to the side at the last second and avoided the blow. She wasn't so lucky the second time, catching a mighty blow to her right shoulder and yelling out in pain. I pumped my legs as hard as I could, yelling out at the man. He turned to look at me and gave her the opportunity to knock him off her. They both scrambled to stand up, but he beat her to her feet. A moment later, he had a pistol in his hand. I was still too far away. Instinct took over. In one smooth motion, I came to a full stop brought my M4 carbine up to my eye and squeezed the trigger the moment I had a good sight picture. The man dropped to the ground, his pistol tumbling from his hand. The woman was looking over the man as I finally got to her, nearly out of breath. 
I could tell now that she was older, early 50s would be my guess, but fit, the type of woman who lived a life of tough physical labor. She clutched her left shoulder as she looked down at the young man by her feet, now dead. Before I could get my breath back to ask her anything, she spoke. That's some darn fine shooting. You just saved my life. She thrust out a hand, which I took. Her grip was strong as she pumped my arm vigorously despite her obviously injured shoulder. Name's Evan, but folks around here call me the Iron Lady. Days 423 to 426. Whatever you want, name it. I had saved the Iron Lady's life. The one person whom threatened the very life of the people I loved most, not to mention hundreds of other free people back in California and beyond. Of course, this means that I had also killed an innocent person. I felt sick to my stomach. We made camp early. Eben, or the Iron Lady as she was known to her troops and those she terrified, recognized Robert, who was as incredulous as I was. Two more of her men joined us. They'd gotten separated in the ambush, an ambush set by partisans fighting the rule of the tyrant whose life I had just saved. Despite nearly dying and her injury, she was cool, calm, and collected. I could see why people gravitated to her. She oozed strength and stability, exactly what people craved the most in this new world. But there was an uncommon intelligence in her eyes that scared me. This wasn't some common thug or the toughest of the toughest who had risen to the top. This was someone who had created an army from the remains of the old world through equal parts strength, cunning, and guile. She was a terrifying opponent. To my surprise, she was also very talkative. Not about her own past, but she questioned Watson and I extensively. The conversation came naturally, not forced as one would expect. Life before the war, how we managed to survive, where we came from. Yet I was sure she was taking very careful mental notes and filing them away somewhere. I wouldn't be surprised if she had internal notes on every last member of her army down to the last lowly foot soldier. She didn't disallow questions about herself, she just chose which to answer and how. All she said about her past was she used to be in the military. The rest was unimportant. What was important, she said, was that not long after the world ended, she had seen the chaos of the wastes and grew determined to civilize it once more. What about eating people, enslaving others? That civilization too? Watson's question shocked me. It was damn near insubordinate, yet the old mountain man continued to stoke the fire slowly, giving no sign of how close to a very dangerous line he must have tread. Doubling up to my surprise, Eben didn't hesitate to respond. Are you familiar with the Old Testament? God gives the Hebrew people rules to live by, and in our mind these rules are harsh, repressive, antiquated. Or at least they used to be. But what most people miss is that these ancient laws were a significant leap ahead of the laws of neighboring kingdoms. For instance, women who were violated in adjacent kingdoms could expect nothing but shame and condemnation. Under Mosaic law, the attacker must pay a dowry to the woman, in addition to whatever other punishment local law calls for. The dowry was to ensure the woman's financial future now that she was unlikely to marry. She cleared her throat, letting her point sink in. Those laws weren't perfected by a long shot, but they were never meant to be. They were a stepping stone up out of the darkness of ignorance. God was meeting his people where they were, knowing they were incapable of accepting modern enlightened lifestyles like in the old world. In time, they'd continue their social evolution, discarding even those laws for new better laws, or at least that was the intent. Now she waved around at the desert outside of the light of our campfire. You've traveled the wastes. How long did it take for people to turn on each other after the fall of the world? A month? Two? I find these behaviors as disgusting as you. My world is a compromise between the old world and this new world. A stepping stone for a better future. I looked at the faces of her men and I had a horrifying realization. She didn't rule this army with fear or strength. They wanted her in charge. They idolized her. She had them heart, minds, and souls. Days 427 to 429. She decided to travel with us. It would be safer than her and her two surviving men traveling alone back to Havasu. Along the way, I managed to snag some time with her out of earshot of the rest of the group, and I told her what I wanted from her. And this is a slave for sale? I didn't think so, I told her. She shook her head. I'm sorry. I owe you my life, and I will honor that. But even I can't break the law. If I did, it'd only encourage anarchy. If she's not for sale, I can't force her owner to sell her. I sighed and nodded my understanding. But if something were to happen to her owner, well, that'd be unfortunate. And I'm sure everybody would be too busy to look carefully as long as he suffered a relatively inconspicuous accident. I took in the meaning of her words. What about law and order? If you think you can bring change and stability to this new world and keep your hands clean, you're a fool. And I traveled with you long enough to know you are no fool. 
and to suspect you're someone who's had to do what needed to be done, knowing if others found out they wouldn't, couldn't understand. I hated how right she was. Days 430 to 435. We arrived at the ranch, who was late on its taxes to be greeted by a family of six. Husband, wife, four children ranging from age 23 to 16. In the old world, the older children would have been off at college. Now they could expect little better than to work at this ranch until they or all their animals died. In a year and a half, we'd reverted straight back to the medieval ages. The family's eyes grew wide at the sight of the Iron Lady herself. She was obviously known even in these remote parts. She didn't yell, threaten, or scream as she inquired as to the missing taxes, and somehow that was more terrifying. Uh, we're, we're sorry, ma'am. We're short on food, and two of the cattle got sick. We think they got into tainted water. Not even the meat's good. Had to burn both bodies. And there just wasn't enough to give and feed ourselves. The Iron Lady nodded. Do you know what your taxes go towards? The rancher blinked in confusion. No, I, uh, to, to you, ma'am? She shook her head. Meat, crops, textiles, raw materials. Some of it goes to work crews, repairing the aqueducts, trying to get some of the infrastructure back online. The rest goes to the army, the troops that patrol these wastes, to keep out the other raiders and bandits. You remember a time before the Army of the Dawn, right? The farmer nodded vigorously. Bad times for everyone. But those days are in the past and it's thanks to my boys and gals. Of course, they can't do their job if I can't feed or clothe them, trade for weapons and ammo. And if they're not doing their job, then other families like yours are put at risk from raiders. She spat on the ground, an edge of steel creeping into her voice. So, by selfishly putting food in your mouth, you're not just hurting my troops, but you're hurting every other family in this valley and beyond. You're costing lives because you don't want to go a bit hungry. I could see the fear creep into the man's eyes, and I nervously eyed the rest of the family, especially the older boy, the 23-year-old. I checked his hands. Was he armed? Wait, what would I even do if he pulled out a gun? Whose side would I even be on? Sergeant, what's the penalty for theft from the government? One of her two surviving team members spoke up in a cold, emotionless voice. Decimation, ma'am. The farmer blanched. The Iron Lady nodded slowly, then turned to me, offering me her pistol. Carry out the sentence, recruit. Kill the eldest, and we'll be taking the youngest to be sold at the market to zero out your debt. Any profit will be sent to your family forthright. I was stunned, staring at the pistol. Recruit? I looked the Iron Lady in the eyes, seeing nothing but steely gray. I'd killed before, a lot. I'd even tortured to get information that ended up saving the lives of my family, but this? If I didn't do it, she might kill me. In fact, I knew she would. It was also part of her law that disobedience of a direct order was punishable by death. But if I didn't… Watson pushed me aside, picked up the weapon and immediately shot the oldest boy in between the eyes. Silence. Then the wailing and sobbing of the mother and sisters. The Iron Lady's two men grabbed the youngest daughter, the 16-year-old, and began to bind her wrists with rope. Apologies, ma'am. He's still… soft. Yet to adjust, but he'll learn. Watson handed her back the pistol. The Iron Lady slowly nodded, watching me the entire time. Days 436 to 440. Watson avoided me on our way back. There'd be a reckoning when we got back to the barracks at Havasu, but how that was going to go down exactly, I didn't know. Robert tried to pull me aside to talk to me, but I dismissed him entirely. I knew what he was going to say already, and frankly, I didn't want to hear it. To my surprise, he seemed genuinely hurt by my dismissal. I couldn't deal with this duality from the people around me, and yet deep down inside I felt like a hypocrite for my outrage, knowing damn well I'd done things that the people I loved most would be horrified to discover, but I did it to keep them safe. And yet, wasn't that what Robert was doing? Wasn't that what Watson did? I was preoccupied not watching my step when I took a significant tumble down a rocky hillside. A jagged desert rock sliced my arm as I landed on it, leaving a deep cut that bled profusely. I immediately bandaged it using my first aid kit, wincing against the significant pain. That night when we stopped for camp, Eben asked me to see my wound. She carefully removed the bandage, grimacing at the sight of it under the firelight. This is bad. Really bad. Hang on. Moments later, she returned with one of the first aid kits, removing a small bottle of alcohol and unsheathing a short knife at her hip. Inspecting my wound once more, she told me to grip my teeth, as she used the knife to slice open part of the wound and dumped the rubbing alcohol into it. You got decent first aid skills, that's good, but this cut's too deep to just bandage. When that rock pierced the skin, it shoved all the dirt and crap on your skin deep into the wound. You gotta cut into the flesh, flush it with alcohol, and get all the foreign debris out. You probably already got some germs in you. I got some antibiotics in my kit, take them twice a day. 
With practice skill, she then began to sew my wound shut once she was satisfied it had been flushed thoroughly. Wound this deep, you risk losing that arm if the infection starts, or worse, don't skip out on those antibiotics. I said little as she worked on my arm, wincing against the pain. I know you're upset with me, I get it. What we did back there was harsh, real harsh, but this is the same land where me and my squad got ambushed. You think they're fully innocent of that? And sick cows due to contamination? Whole herd would have died. She shook her head sadly, willing to bet they're feeding those rebels, probably giving them intelligence too. Finally, she was done with my arm and she leaned in to bite off the string she used to sew me close. I know you probably think I'm a monster right now. I don't blame you for it. But if one ranch starts to find the laws, others will get ideas. And then we're all back to square one, fighting and killing each other all over again. Was she right? I thought back to Farmbridge and Big Bear. They seemed to be doing okay without all this violence and fear. But compared to what Evan was building, they were backwater outposts. The Iron Lady was building a nation of thousands from radioactive waste. Was that even possible without some fear and violence? Days 441 to 445. Eben diverted us on the way back to Havasu so we could stop by one of the small encampments the army had established in the area. It served as a staging area for patrols who kept the peace, and a supply link with the other posts which enforced the borders of the territory belonging to the Army of the Dawn. In time, new roads would be built, and the perimeter posts would be upgraded to proper fortifications. I wondered what in the world the Army of the Dawn needed forts to protect them from, and I got my answer. There was nobody to greet us as we approached the encampment, which should have been impossible as men should have been keeping watch around the clock. From a distance, I could see that the place consisted of the same sand-filled Hesco barriers that we used in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were even two guard towers set up, and you could see where work had been done for more permanent fortifications. But there was not a soldier in sight. The smell was almost overwhelming as we finally entered the encampment, and the sight that greeted us inside was straight out of a nightmare. Bodies lay everywhere, all of them soldiers. There had been several families here as well, but there wasn't a civilian in sight. Most disturbing of all was the fact that the bodies had been stripped of their clothing, and all matter of symbols carved on their flesh. One of the corpses still had a rope tied around its wrists, indicating the carving had taken place while they were still alive. The Iron Lady leaned in close enough so only I could hear. You wonder why my methods can be so harsh? This is why. Take it all in. I took the entire nightmare in processing the almost supernatural carnage all around me. There wasn't a single body from whoever had done this. The only clue they left behind was the missing families and the carved up bodies. Who or what could have done this? What lurked in the waste that scared and even preyed on an army of cannibals and raiders? Days 446 to 451. There were plenty of tools left behind, but digging enough graves in the hard desert soil would have taken days. Eben refused to leave her soldiers behind to be eaten by scavengers, so she had us pile them together under one large bonfire. She didn't flinch from helping with the work herself either. In fact, she treated the bodies with a sense of reverence. The Iron Lady was clearly a sociopath, manipulative, evil to her core, and yet she seemed genuinely to care about the men under her command. This woman that commanded thousands was an enigma wrapped in a riddle. They called themselves Aztecos. They used powerful hallucinogenics and practiced what they called blood magic, something that they claimed was passed down to their priests from the ancient Aztecs themselves. Like the Aztecs, they lived in a state of perpetual warfare against anyone weaker than them, raiding and plundering any community they came across. Slaves had an even chance between being put to work or ritualistically sacrificed and then devoured. At first, they were small bands of survivors coming north from Mexico, former cartel members and their lackeys. Soon, more of the former cartel members made the trip north, bringing with them deep superstition and belief in black magic. Now, they were an army big enough to challenge the Army of the Dawn, but the saving grace was that they were all complete psychopaths and difficult to organize. This was not the first raid in the Iron Lady's territory, but what concerned her was how deep they'd struck this time. They typically attack one of the border posts, but now a group had managed to sneak past them and take out an entire fortified camp. They were growing bolder. They were trying to send a message. We made haste back to Havasu. The Iron Lady wrapped up in her own thoughts the entire trip back. Days 452 to 457. For saving her life, Evan granted me and Watson our own accommodations and fast-tracked our recruitment process. We were officially part of the Army of the Dawn. She then requested that I come to see her at her headquarters in about a week after I handled my personal business. What she was referring to, of course, was Christina and the blank check she'd given me to handle the situation as I saw fit as long as it was done quietly. I hurried to find her as soon as we got back. 
Easier now that I had a free pass to come and go largely whenever I want. Rumors had already begun to spread about how I saved the Iron Lady's life, so some people already recognized me and gave me a degree of respect. Nobody wanted to cross someone in the Iron Lady's good graces. On the face of others though, I saw naked jealousy. Eben was like a religious figure to many of these people. She had manipulated the masses cleverly, worming her way into the hearts and souls. The Iron Lady was more than a leader, she was a messiah. Christina was in one of the workshops, apparently picking up goods for her owner. The word disgusted me. But my heart skipped a beat when I found her. I was worried something may have happened in my long absence. She turned and noticed me, did the best she could to hide her smile, but it was unmistakably there. And so were several large bruises across her face. I had been mulling over the Iron Lady's carte blanche to handle the situation as I saw fit. After the incident with the rancher's son, I had lost my appetite for violence. Her reasoning and justification only made me more angry at her and at myself for the times I'd used that same reasoning to do horrible things to others. Yet, here was Christina, with my arms wrapped tightly around her and doing her best not to cry into my shoulder, face full of bruises from a savage beating. The Iron Lady was right. The law was the law. But some evil could only be eliminated by operating outside of it. I didn't tell her anything. I just held her for a while in a secret corner of the workshop. Then, kissing her on the forehead, I promised that she'd be free soon. I had struck a deal with the Iron Lady. She looked concerned, but hopeful. Days 458 to 462. Finding the right time to strike was crucial, and this required intelligence. I shadowed Saul to learn his routines, even bought off a few street urchins to keep tabs on him when I couldn't. Bullets, food, and materials were currency, and with my extra rations, courtesy of the Iron Lady, I could afford to keep my young spies watching 24-7. Finally, I understood his movements well enough to start making a plan. I didn't tell Christina. If all went well, she'd never even find out. Days 463 to 466. Saul's home was a two-story townhouse he'd taken over. He kept his three slaves in a room next to his, which they all shared. Though he didn't lock the girls in, there was no point. The slave callers were padlocked, and anyone would immediately spot them and drag them back for severe punishment if they escaped. And if they did make it out into the desert, there was no fresh water or food for days aside from the heavily patrolled lake. Escape was a death sentence. I waited until late, when I'd be sure he was asleep. Dressed in all black, I scaled the garage and got on its roof. This gave me access to his bedroom window. There weren't many patrols in this residential area, and neighbors were few and far between. Looking at the window, I was relieved to find it open. I figured it would be, since there was no air conditioning anymore, and the desert nights could still get warm, even with nuclear winter cooling going on. I slipped inside his room, silent as a shadow, putting to use every bit of my old military training. He was on the bed, rolled on his side, facing away from me. I didn't carry my pistol with me, just a knife. I didn't want to make a noise that would alert someone, and Evan had said to leave as little a mess as possible. One quick thrust from behind straight into the base of his spine would sever his spinal column and paralyze him from the neck down. It was a tricky execution, and you wouldn't want to risk it if, for example, you were taking out an enemy patrol. But when your target is asleep, and with his back to you, I unsheathed my knife, but hesitated. I was going to take the life of a monster in order to save the life of a woman I loved, but was it still murder? Was there another way? Despite myself, Alexis's face flashed into my memory. And that's when Saul rolled over with a grunt, one eye half open. Both eyes flew open when they spotted me just a few feet away, frozen in my hesitation. He rose with a roar, and I immediately sprung forward, driving my blade toward his exposed throat. With a meaty fist, though, he swatted the knife away, earning himself a cut that went to the bone across his knuckles. His other fist smashed into my chest, knocking me away and driving the breath out of me. Saul was a mountain of a man, lots of body fat and yet surprisingly strong and agile. He leapt out of bed and rushed toward me as I struggled to stand. I delivered a snap kick to his knee and heard a satisfying crunch as I drove the kneecap backwards, causing it to fracture. He let out another roar and crashed down to the ground, but not before grabbing me and dragging me under him. I was now under nearly 300 pounds of his body weight. Saul's fetid breath on my face as he grunted in pain and rage, trying to wrap his hands around my throat. I was pinned, could hardly move. He put his good knee on my left arm, pinning it, and my knife hand to the ground. I smashed my head into his face in a brutal headbutt once, twice, three times, feeling the cartilage and bone in his face break from the assault. But he didn't relent. His hands found my throat and began to squeeze. I started to see stars. Then, there was a sickening wet thump as something hit him in the back of his head followed by another smash to the side of his face. Saul groaned and his eyes rolled up to the back of his head. He relinquished his grip on my throat enough for me to pry myself loose 
and drag my left arm out from under his massive leg. In an instant, I'd driven the knife deep into Saul's throat. Pulling myself free from under the giant man, I gasped for breath. Christina was there, holding a fire poker. There were tears streaming down her eyes. Days 467 to 470. I moved Christina and her two liberated friends to me and Watson's place. One message to the Iron Lady was all it took to tidy up any loose ends. Saul's body disappeared, and nobody said a word about the reacquisition of his slaves. I slept next to Christina at night, an arm around her, but she remained distant and quiet. The trauma of Saul's death was still fresh. Finally, on the second night, she opened up. I went in to kiss her, and she backed up abruptly. I'm sorry, I just… I, I can't stop seeing Saul's body. I know he did terrible things to me and to others, but I killed him. Now every time I look at you, I just think about what I did. I didn't press the issue. I understood. Even after all the violence she'd seen and endured in the past year and three months, she'd never killed anyone. And I had forced her to, by breaking into Saul's house. I couldn't help but feel that after freeing Christina, she was further from me than she was when she was Saul's property. Days 471 to 474. The Iron Lady had made her headquarters at the former government building for Lake Havasu City. All but one of the entrances had been fortified, though, so that any would-be assassins could only enter through the main front entrance, which was heavily guarded. Anyone entering was heavily vetted. Apparently, the Iron Lady had quite a few enemies out there, and I was willing to guess they weren't all amongst the Aztecos. Watson and I were expected and quickly shuffled inside. We had yet to speak about the incident at the ranch, and we'd both been distant from each other. His actions had definitely caused a rift between us, but we were here on a job, and this place was a treasure trove of intelligence we could definitely use. Our eyes and ears were on high alert, picking up on every scrap of information we came across and filing it away mentally so we could write it down later. The Iron Lady was in a conference room that had been turned into her war room, complete with a large map encompassing California, Arizona, and Nevada to the north. In a wide radius around Lake Havasu City was a perimeter made up of red pushpins that seemed to be the extent of the Iron Lady's territory. I was grateful to see that it went east far further than west. It seems her forces had done very little to move toward California. Along the perimeter and inside of it were larger green pushpins. I recognized the location of the outpost that the Aztecos had hit and figured these must be the location of forts or other outposts. There was only one toward California. Apparently, the army didn't expect much trouble from that direction, and to be honest, they were right. But there were multiple along the eastern and southern border of the territory. Past the eastern and southern borders were large black pins, driven into the map in several places. I guessed that these were known locations of Azteco strongholds. There was a disturbing concentration of them around Phoenix, the capital of Arizona. One single, smaller black pin was right across the old US-Mexico border in Mexicali. This one disturbed me deeply as it was only a hundred miles or so south of Farmbridge. Speaking of which, a single blue pin was driven right on the southern tip of the Salton Sea, right on top of what was now called Farmbridge. Looking north, I spotted Big Bear. Seems a smaller pin had once been driven near it, but had been removed. I could still see the hole on the map. The Iron Lady finished speaking with several of her men, one of which rushed out in a hurry and turned her attention to us. I've seen you out in the field. You know what you're doing, and you're both experienced from the old world. I had a special assignment for you two, but it seems it's largely unnecessary now. Watson and I looked at each other warily. I would meant to dispatch you out to enemy territory to scout the enemy, but it seems as if the enemy has decided to come to us instead. Pack your gear, and make sure you're well stocked from the armory. Requisition body armor if you don't have any. We're going to war. Days 478 to 480. I hadn't heard the sounds of engines in so long that the sound was almost abrasive to my ears. Four striker-armed vehicles rumbled in the parking lot that was the staging area for the Iron Lady's forces. Men and women milled about, loading up supplies into the trailers that would be pulled by the strikers. They would lead the way, carrying a company's worth of equipment. The rest of us would go on foot, giving the forces already out at Greenwood by the Big Sandy River time to unpack the equipment and shore up their defenses. If we weren't delayed, we'd be there a few days before the expected arrival of an entire army of Aztecos. Looking up at the armored vehicles, I now know why Robert had said it was pointless to resist the Iron Lady and her forces. She had a small fleet of armored vehicles and the fuel to keep them operational. Some of the men in the army had been engineers and chemists. Stabilizing large stockpiles of fuel had been relatively simple. While most of the world had to deal with fuel that had already gone bad in their gas tanks, the Army of the Dawn had enough for a small fleet of combat vehicles. Without anti-tank weapons, artillery, or air power, no force could resist her if she dispatched a large group of them to overrun a rebellious settlement. Christina was there to see me off. Her big, almond-shaped eyes were moist with tears that she hadn't cried yet, and she hugged me tight as I reassured her that everything would be alright. I'd soon return. I felt a lot of the old love flooding back in the last month, 
but I couldn't deny that something had changed between us. She'd abandoned me back in the old world, calling off our engagement, and had yet to give me a clear reason why. Meanwhile, I had put her in a position where she had to murder, and I knew deep down inside she hadn't forgiven me for it. This was exactly what I had feared happening with Alexis. Maybe it was a good thing I'd left then. Maybe I really did belong with this army of raiders. I felt like I was growing more confused by the day. As I bid Christina goodbye, I realized one thing. It didn't hurt leaving her behind the way it had hurt leaving Alexis. I shoved that thought away and buried it, setting my mind to the fight to come. Days 481 to 486. Watson and I weren't assigned to any particular unit. Instead, Evan said that she just wanted us to go along and help as needed. This put us in a position of some respect, and we got envious glances from soldiers we marched with. As far as I knew, she was planning on using our skills of moving behind enemy lines for reconnaissance. She had no idea that moving behind enemy lines was exactly what we were doing right now. And yet, despite the Army of the Dawn being a threat to everyone I loved back home, I was now marching to battle with them. I'd honestly grown to like Robert. Deep down inside, he was a kind man caught up in a world gone bad, forced to make some tough decisions. And I suppose there were more like them amongst the rest of the Iron Lady soldiers. But the rest? How many of my comrades in arms were murderers, raiders, or cannibals? Watson reminded me that it didn't matter right now. All our lives were on the line. We had a company's worth of soldiers moving east toward Greenwood, so approximately 120 or so. There were an additional 40 permanently stationed there on the border of the Iron Lady's territory alongside their families. From what I heard, a small community had sprung up in the relative safety of the fort, but they had already fled west. Scout reports said a force of Aztecos was moving northwest out of Congress on Highway 93. I remembered Congress. I'd driven through it on my way to Phoenix a lifetime ago. Now it was on the edge of disputed territory between the Army of the Dawn and the Aztecos. The scouts could only estimate numbers. They didn't stick around long enough for a good count, knowing they'd need to get word to Havasu as soon as possible. Estimates, however, put the Aztecos at about 200. I'd fought in war back in the old world, but I'd always been on the side with superior technology and air support. Sure, I'd be more than a few scraps deep in hostile territory where none of that mattered, but our training, equipment, and doctrine had always been superior. Even amongst the best Taliban or insurgent fighters, there were no peers to US Army Cav Scouts. But war had changed. We had four strikers, and they would put a hurting on an enemy without combat vehicles, but most of the soldiers of the Iron Lady's army had only the training provided to them by some veterans in her ranks. The playing field felt uncomfortably level, and they had the numbers advantage. Days 487 to 490. When we arrived at Greenwood, the news went from bad to worse. The incoming group of Aztecos had been reinforced by two more bands, and now scouts estimated their numbers at around 300. We were outnumbered almost 3 to 1, but we still had the strikers and an assortment of heavy weapons. As the rest of the troops began to build the fence works, the Iron Lady called me into her war council. Given my background, she wanted to know what could be done to harass and delay the incoming enemy. This was classic US Army doctrine, using light infantry to harass an incoming force, but we didn't have enough trained men and women or the right tools for the job. If we had more warning, I would have recommended we set up scouts along Highway 93. They would have to take the highway north out of Congress before hooking into the desert to push west toward our position at Greenwood. However, to get here, they'd have to go through several narrow desert valleys, perfect spots for ambushes, and terrain well suited for ambushers to slip away to safety. But we had no time, and we couldn't even begin to guess which desert passes they had used to advance. I shrugged my shoulders, apologizing. There's nothing we could do, just dig in and wait. She was unhappy with my response, but seemed to understand. As the meeting continued though, I felt completely useless. At night, I eventually had time to talk to Watson, and I finally felt mentally prepared for it. You hesitated, yet you knew the price for disobedience. You jeopardized our mission here. I shook my head sadly. I knew he was right. But shooting that kid in the face. Watson, there has to be a line somewhere. There has to be a point where wrong is just plain wrong. And uh, how's Christina, by the way? Or Alana? Ruslana? How about the folks you left behind in Big Bear? Watson went silent for a moment, then pulled his cowboy hat down over his face as he prepared to go to sleep. You tell me when you find that line. Half of me knew he was right, the other half was disgusted. As I lay down to go to sleep, I wasn't sure which half was winning, but both halves knew that Alexis would be disappointed in me for everything I'd done in the last year. Days 491 to 497. There's an unsettling anticipation in the days before an operation. I always found it worse than the actual combat itself. At least in combat, you were in combat, not sitting and waiting for it to come, wondering who would live and who would die and on which side of that divide you'd end up. War was easy, waiting was tough. 
The Big Sandy River was more sand than river, or precisely all sand in Zero River. That was a shame, as a water feature would have given us considerable advantage. Instead, we were forced to set up defensive positions on the other side of the dried up riverbed, along the perimeter of the concrete cinder block outpost. We were on a slight rise, which was good for lines of sight, but gave very little tactical advantage. The terrain was simply indefensible. Whoever had chosen this spot for an outpost had been a fool and might have gotten us all killed. We filled sandbags and built trenches along the perimeter of the outpost, putting heavy machine guns, including one 50 cal and four M240 Bravos on the perimeter wall atop sandbag platforms. The strikers were put two apiece on each end of our defensive line. Three of them were armed with 50 caliber machine guns, and one had a Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. I was very glad for the Mark 19. The indiscriminate volley of explosive grenades it fired at long ranges had saved my bacon more than once. We built supplemental trenches along our flanks, but there was little fear of being flanked. The terrain was simply too flat, and there was no cover. If an assault was going to be successful, it would have to rely on overwhelming numbers from the front, as heavy fire support was apparently not an option. As we finished our defensive works, I had to admit, even though the Aztecos had superior numbers, we had a significant advantage over them. There was a little to no cover for them to use in a frontal assault, and our scouts reported they had spotted no heavy vehicles. Unless they miraculously had air power of some sort for this battle, it was shaping up to be an absolute bloodbath. I should have never underestimated our enemy. Days 498 to 500. They were near. We could hear the drums in the distance along with the sound of hundreds of voices chanting, groaning, and screaming. It sounded like the mouth of hell itself had opened up somewhere out in the dark desert night. This was part of their rituals, one of the platoon sergeants told me. The Aztecos practiced ancient blood magic, which they combined with powerful drugs to whip up their soldiers into a murderous frenzy. In previous encounters, some of their men had taken multiple high-caliber rounds to the chest and kept advancing. I didn't believe in magic, but I did believe in the power of drugs to turn men into mindless killing machines, and I firmly believed the power of psychological warfare to demoralize an opponent before fighting even started. I went to see Evan in her command tent to raise my concerns. We need to do something about the men, ma'am. They've been sitting in their positions listening to that screaming, drumming, and chanting for two days and nights now. It's not good for the morale. They're terrified. The Iron Lady was looking over some letters delivered by messenger, news from back home. Even on the front line, she was still lord over a sizable chunk of the American Southwest and, like any ruler, had domestic business that needed attending to. Finally, she paused and looked up at me. You're right. What do you recommend? Well, ma'am, to put it bluntly, the men worship you. They idolize you. They see you as a savior. They need to hear from you. A rousing speech could do much to shore up morale. She took my words with careful deliberation. I agree. That's a very good idea. Standing, she reached for her combat gear and buckled it on. Even in the dim light of the tent, she looked very much like an ancient warrior queen, only decked out in modern combat gear. Approaching me, she stopped just a few feet short. I'm a savior to my army, but I wonder, what do you think I am? I froze. My mind raced. Part of me deeply admired her. Part of me was revolted by her. I opened my mouth to speak, say anything, and break the awkward silence, but then I spotted movement in the darkness behind her. Instinct took over. I grabbed Evan and pulled her behind me, shielding her with my body. Two darts thudded into my body armor. I glanced down at them in surprise for a moment before combat instincts continued their work. I snapped up my pistol as the figure leapt out of the darkness. Beside it, a second figure was crawling through a small rip in the tent it had quietly cut with a large knife. I fired before the figure could reach me, two in the chest. When it hit the floor, I put another one in the head and turned my attention to the figure slithering into the tent. To the left of us, two more figures leapt out of the darkness, but Eben was on them. The thunder of her revolver would be heard throughout the entire camp as it rang out twice and two more bodies hit the floor. My attacker was the only one left, but he was surprisingly fast, ducking under my fire and closing the distance terrifyingly quickly. He had a knife in hand and slashing out of my belly, but I squatted down so the blade bit into my combat armor instead. Lashing out with his other hand, he tried to knock my weapon away, and for a moment we were both locked into close quarters. I grabbed him by the arm and tossed him to the ground with a judo hip toss, then finished him off with my firearm. Guards rushed in, but it was all over. The four would-be assassins lay dead at our feet. Now that they were out of the shadows of the corner of the tent where they had silently cut their way in, I could see them properly, and what lay before me was terrifying to behold. I now understood why the soldiers feared the Aztecos, and why superstition ran rampant throughout the troops. The dead men were naked, except for a sandy brown loincloth around their hips. They didn't even wear shoes. Their teeth were blackened, I was guessing with charcoal or something similar, and sharpened to points. I had heard of an African tribe that worshipped crocodiles, and to honor them, the men would have square patterns cut into their flesh of their arms, legs, and back. 
The resulting scars would be raised off the flesh and resemble the plated scales of a crocodile. These men had undergone a similar mutation, but all over their bodies, even their faces and shaved heads, and in completely random patterns. As I turned over one of the corpses to get a better look, Evan joined me. These are their scouts and assassins. Matadores, they call them. Killers. They cut their flesh like this so it blends in with the desert ground. It was a horrifying sight, but I had to agree their tanned skin and scarred bodies would make it difficult to spot one lurking in the desert. Explained how they'd gotten so close. I was starting to understand why the Aztecos were so feared. This wasn't an army of men at our doorstep, it was an army of monsters. The sound of one of the strikers' 50 caliber machine guns going off brought me back to the real world. Moments later, the other two gun strikers joined in. The sound of men shouting out orders filled the air, and from somewhere out in the nighttime desert came a horrible wailing sound building up to a screaming crescendo that made my blood run cold. Now go check out I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War to see how our story began, or click this other video here.